take your Bibles tonight and turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. This is an advanced class on power for abundant living. And as we all know, in John 10:10, 10, 10, it said that Jesus Christ came that we might have life and have it hell more abundantly. Most people would be grateful if they manifested an abundant life. But Jesus Christ didn't come to give us an abundant life. He came to give us a life which is more than abundant. Now in order to get into this advanced class, I know of no better place tonight to start than to again remind you that there are two gods in this world. Most people believe there's only one and that's one of the finest counterfeits of Satan to get everybody to believe that the true God's accountable for all the damnable stuff he does and all the trouble he brings, all the sorrow he magnifies and all the defeats in which people get engaged. To have the so-called Christian people say that the true God the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is responsible for all of that devilish stuff. That is perhaps the finest perpetrated lie of Satan today. And this is an advanced class. And I want to tell you something. We're not dealing with chicken soup here or bologna. This is not a class where we're going to talk about twiddling things and little stuff. This is where we're going to open up in this class to know exactly what your enemy is and what kind of fight he puts up and how he fights so that you can wage a good warfare. The word of God says that you are to be a messenger of him, that you are an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. It says you're his witnesses. It says that we're his soldiers and that we are his workmen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if we are messengers for him, if we are ambassadors for him, if we are witnesses, if we are soldiers, if we are workmen for him, then for God's sake, let's make up our minds how to work and then get in there and do something about it. If you're in this class to have your ear balls tickled, I'll be rid of you by Tuesday night. I'm not in here to tickle your ear balls. I'm in here to teach you the greatness of God's word and find out whether you got the guts to walk on it or whether you haven't got it. And whether you got the brain cells to absorb God's word and then put it into practice in your life. This is an advanced class. And I won't be waiting around to find out whether you can speak in tongues and interpret or not. You better be able to. Same way with prophecy, right down the line, sharp as a meatball and twice as juicy. <laughs> so, to keep the record straight, this is a class where we're dealing with the reality of the one great God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and God's arch enemy, who is the devil, Satan that most people don't even believe exists today inside of the Christian church. If so, he's just a word that you use because it appeared someplace in the Bible. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our, what? Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, there is the one God, this one God, and there is only one God, there are not three, there are not four thousand, there is one God, and this one God is the Father of our what? And if the Lord Jesus Christ was God, God had a Father himself, how stupid can you get? Well, it's surprising how stupid a man can get. You can get so stupid being an intellectual that you couldn't see light from darkness because I know PhDs in every denomination and they're not stupid. 
but when it comes to spiritual things, you would think they hadn't been through kindergarten. That's right. How many people have you met have been in churches a lifetime and don't even know the books of the Bible? Don't answer that one. That's right. Now here it's talking about one, one God. And this one God, this one God is the God and Father of our what? Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And there is only one God and that God whom we serve here at the Way Headquarters and you serve in your life and we want people all over the world to serve is the Father, the Father, the Father. And if you're a father, you've got seed. He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one God. That's the God of the advanced class that we dig, that we work on to get from the Word to see exactly what we have in Him and what He expects of us to do so that we can fight a good warfare, that we can be wonderful messengers and workmen and ambassadors knowing where we're going with the power of God in our life. The same truth is presented in Colossians. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 2. To the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ. The faithful what? Brethren. brethren. When you're born again of God's Spirit and I'm born again of God's Spirit, then we're brothers spiritually. God is our Father. We are His children. That's why Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is the way of a father with his family. God is our Father. We are His children. All other religions are religions. They're man-made. Hinduism, Shintoism, Taoism, Muhammad, all of those are religions, what man does. But Christianity is what God wrought in Christ Jesus. Christianity is the father with his family. And God's not the father of all the nincompoops in the world. God's only the father of those whom he has fathered. Like you are only the father of the children you have fathered. You're not the father of all the kids running all over town, praise God. You're only the father of those children you have fathered. God is only the father of those children whom he has fathered. And when the people talk about the fatherhood of uh, the, uh, the father, uh, what is that? Uh, brotherhood of man, fatherhood of God or something. That's a bunch of baloney. That's right. You know who they are? They're these liberal, unbelieving, God-rejecting people who want to tell us that the true God is the God of everybody in the world and that everybody in the world's my brother. That's a lie. God is only the father of those whom he has fathered and the brotherhood of man, he's only the brother of those who belong to him. And when the Word of God says I have to be especially good to the household of faith, it doesn't say I have to be good at all to those on the outside. But to my brothers in the Lord, yes. That's why here he says, to the saints and the faithful, the faithful, the faithful brethren, you can be my brother and still not be what? Faithful, because you can trip up every two minutes on God's Word. One minute you can stand for God's Word, and the next minute flip out. This is not addressed, and the advanced class is not addressed to, to trip out, strip out, freak outs, and all the rest of them. It's addressed to the faithful in Christ Jesus. If you want to be faithful to Him, then that's what we're here for. Grace be to you and peace from God our what? And the Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father, God our Father, God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ 
his only begotten Son. In Philippians chapter 1, the same truth. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the what? Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 2. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received what? Mercy. Why, I love that hymn number 62 we just sang. It's mercy and it's grace that we're to gather in this day and time and hour. It's just the grace of God that you are even saved, heaven bound, and all hell can't stop you. That's just grace and mercy, that's all. We faint not, but, verse 2, but have renounced, have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God how deceitfully. And if there's any one thing that's being done across our country from almost every major pulpit in our nation and minor pulpit is that they're handling the word of God deceitfully. They are sincere, but sincerity's no guarantee for truth. That's right. The word of God rightly divided is the only truth. And they are handling the word of God deceitfully. Verse 3 says, If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are what? Here it is, verse 4. In whom the God of this what? World. Uh, then there must be another God besides the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There must be another God. And that God is the God and Father of the children of this world, the kids that he fathers, those who are born of his seed, that Jesus said and talked about in the Gospels when he said, you're of your father, the devil. They're born of the seed of the serpent. And this God of this world, the God of this world is old Satan. And he is a big God. He's got power. He's got all kinds of ability. And most people just talk at best. Just use the name or say some things about it. But they never realize that it's a present, dynamic, powerful force against which we are wrestling. It's just mouth talk. It's just blow. It's just words that come off the top of a man or woman's brain cells because they read it someplace or heard it in the word. Therefore, there are two basic gods. One is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The other is the God of this world. And that's basically all there is. Because the whole thing in life is geared to a spiritual warfare. The problems in life are not politics. The problems in life are not academic pursuits. The problems in life are not sex and all this other stuff. The problems in life are basically spiritual. You get the spiritual problem settled and everything else would and will settle itself. Now there are two gods. And it's those two gods we must understand. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we as Christian believers can apply the principles that he says we must apply. And we must understand the God of this world, how he operates. For the word says, we are not ignorant of his devices. Well, if we're not ignorant, then we ought to smarten up. Just to say you're not ignorant can mean that you're stupider than stupid. Because you've just said the word. That doesn't mean a thing to me. When men say to me they're not ignorant of Satan's devices, I want you to tell me seven points on where you're not ignorant. Number one, number two, number three, seven of them. If you don't even know one, you must be stupid. 
If you only know seven, you're still stupid. Because there must be 50 major points in the word that it says we're not to be ignorant of basically when it comes to how the devils operate. But you see, we've been talked out of it. We think anybody that talks about devil spirits needs a psychiatrist. Or needs some psychotherapy of some kind. Maybe the other people need it on the other side. Maybe they have their evaluation wrong, their principles wrong. You figure it out. In Mark chapter 3, You know that Jesus' basic ministry here upon earth was primarily and solely to fight against the God of this world? That's what he was here for. Well, and we say that we are his and he is ours, then what do you think our fight is? Against Maggie Muggins? Johnny Jump Up? Snowball Pete? Henry Blue? It's a spiritual fight in Mark chapter 3. Let me read you this. Look at verse... Oh, it doesn't make much difference, I suppose. 22. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem, they came from the top religious echelon. They said of Jesus, He has Beelzebub. And by the prince of the devils, Beelzebub, Jesus Christ cast he out what? Huh. In other words, they said Jesus has a big old devil, and by this big old devil, he's casting out these little devils, you know. Yeah. After all, you've got a captain in there. What's the buck private going to do? He coming up and out. Sure. If there's a colonel in there, the captain will move. But the big one will never come till he puts out the little ones. That's what they said Jesus was doing. He says he's got a bigger devil, so with that bigger devil, he's casting out little devils. Later on, when I get you in the advanced class, deeper in, and we get into discerning of spirits, I'll show you exactly what happens in a spiritualist meeting. In an ESP category, where they say they're casting out spirits, I'll show you exactly from the word what they're casting out. They're doing exactly this. One big old devil spirit kicking another devil spirit out, and they call that casting out evil spirits. Oh, shit. Ha! Look what he said. Jesus, and he called them unto him and said unto them, How can Satan cast out what? That's right. And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot what? So we've got two kingdoms. One is the kingdom of our God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. The other kingdom is the kingdom of Satan. They're kingdoms. And in kingdoms, you have Top brass and little brasses. You have authority coming down the line. It's a kingdom. And in order to have a kingdom, you have to have a king. Because kingdom means the supremacy or the reign of a king. And a king is top brass. When the king says jump, the people of the kingdom don't ask how high, they just jump. If a house, verse 25, if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot what? And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot what? Right. But has a, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he'll spoil his house. If you want to get in where, and help people where Satan lives and get the devil out, you got to have more power. you got to be able to bind him. you got to be able to tie him up, else you can't get in there to clean house. A tremendous thing in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. No wonder Satan wants us to believe there's only one God at both heaven and earth, that he's the God up there, he's the God down here, and he's responsible for all the sickness, all the death, everything else that goes on. Then the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ takes all the blame for what old Satan does. In Luke chapter 10, you will recall if you know the word previously, Jesus Christ had sent out twelve, the twelve apostles. And he had given them authority 
over the enemy and so forth, and sent them unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then in chapter 10, verse 1, he appointed 70 others. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, and sent them, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. And in verse 17, it says, And the seventy returned. They finally came home off of that witnessing mission. And when they returned, they returned with what? Joy. They returned with joy. They were really turned on. Why? Saying, Lord, even the devils, even the devils, even the devils are subject unto us to thy what? Name. The devils were subject. Well, this is that other kingdom that you're wrestling against. The devils were subject unto them, unto the people, through thy name. And then Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. It's real cute. You know why? Because when these 70 really went to work along with the 12, old Satan himself had to get off his chair and come on down and take a look what was going on because they were just blowing his kingdom to peace. That's why he said he saw him like lightning coming down. But he didn't waste any time. He came right down. Sure. You got to understand a little bit of the oriental usage of words. <laughs> look what he said in verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power. I give you what? Power. power. Well, if he gave the 70 power and he gave the 12 power, do you and I have any less after the day of Pentecost than they had before? We better not or we better go back and live before. I give you power, 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 power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, over all, over all, over all the power of us. Well, glory, hallelujah. If he gave us power over all the enemy, then we've got power over all the enemy. Now, just to say you've got power won't manifest it. But to know how to utilize it does it. Let's say you got a 380 horsepower automobile sitting in your garage. Have you got power? Only potential. You can sit in the house and pray for that thing to start. Nothing happens. You can go out and stick the key in the exhaust pipe. Still nothing happens. <laughs> Boy, that's exactly where we are in our Christian walk. People want to take the key and put it in the exhaust pipe and want to see the power. It doesn't work that way. You've got to learn how to spiritually release that power. Well, how did you learn to drive an automobile? How did you learn where the key went? How do you learn to honk the horn? How do you learn to put on the brake, to turn signals, the radio, all of that? How did you learn? Somebody was. Amen. That's how you learn the word, too. And once, once you know how to utilize that power, then you can insert the key and you can get that 380 horse off and running. Squeal the tires. Goodyear likes that. Firestone enjoys. I give you power over all the enemy, over all the power of the enemy. And nothing, and nothing, and nothing shall by any means what? And the word nothing means what? If it doesn't mean nothing, then you tell me what it means. Then I have nothing to communicate in. When he said nothing shall in any way hurt you, he means nothing. Then if things are hurting us, time and time again, then it must be we who are slipping and not God or his word. 
It must be that we as Christians do not know how to release this power, how to tap in, how to walk, how to manifest. Can all, it's all it can be. It's all it can be. Because he certainly didn't give us less than he gave to people before the day of Pentecost. says in verse 20, Notwithstanding in, in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. Don't just rejoice that the spirits, the devil spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are where? Well, glory, hallelujah, that's wonderful. You ought to get all hot and bothered spiritually, turned on that your names are written, that you have eternal life, that you're heaven bound and all hell can't stop, that you're turned on for him. That's wonderful that you're saved. Glory be. But in the meantime, while we're going that way, how about having a little fun? <laughs> how about utilizing that power that he's given you? How about working it in concretion, in manifestation? So that again, God can get the glory of the greatness of the redemption in Christ Jesus in your life and in mine. In First John, the epistle. First John chapter 3. Context I understand, but there's a segment of this verse I want to refresh your mind on. Verse 8. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil what? Sinneth from the beginning. The devil sinneth from the beginning. Now watch it. For this purpose, here's the purpose, that the Son of God was what? Manifested, seen here upon earth, God's only begotten Son. That He, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, might destroy the works of what? The devil. That's what He came for. That He might destroy the works of the devil. Well, if there is no devil, why should He have to come to destroy it? That's right. If there is no Satan, if there are no evil spirits, what did he have to come for to destroy it? How stupid. This was the purpose of his mission here upon earth. Right. Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When the even was come, they brought unto him Jesus, many that were what? Possessed with devils. Now, if you're going to get possessed with devils, there have to be some devils around. Spirits around. And he, Jesus, cast out the spirits. He wouldn't cast out eternal life spirit. He wouldn't cast out the spirit of the Holy Spirit. He must have cast out evil spirits, devil spirits. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were what? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, here it is, himself, Jesus, took our infirmities and bare our what? Sicknesses. He did this for us. In Ephesians chapter 6, Verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in who? Lord. Amen. Be strong in the Lord. Not in your theology or my theology, your doctrine or my doctrine. Not in your particular denominational cliche or mine. But we're to be strong in who? Lord. And in the power of his what? Right. Then in verse 11, he tells you to do something. Put on. That's your job. Put it on. Put on the whole armor of what? God's job is one thing, your job is something else. God doesn't slough off on his job either. And we're not a slough off. We're to put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the what? Of the devil. That's our whole job. That's what you have to put the armor on for. If you think you're going to have an easy time, you've got a guess coming. The easiest time you ever had was when you were unsaved. 
When you got saved, you got into a fight. Before that, you were unsaved, you already belonged to him, Satan. Then he didn't have to. But once you got born again, now he's got to do everything he can to defeat your testimony in this life. He's got to do everything to make you as a Christian look worse than the unbeliever out there who has not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, he says, put on the armor that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then comes that great 12th verse. For we wrestle not against Herman and Maggie and Johnny. We wrestle not against flesh and what? Sense knowledge why Satan gets people to think it's a fight between this man and that man, between this woman and that woman, or between this man and that woman, between this nation and that nation. It's not. The word of God says we do not wrestle against what? And that's all man is, a body and soul. He's just flesh and blood. And it's not a wrestling against flesh and blood, but, but, and the word but in verse 12 sets in contrast that which follows with that which precedes. It's a grammatical law, a usage semantically of words very accurately. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Then there must be something else we wrestle against. These are principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this life. And who is top ruler? That's right. And all of his devil spirits, evil spirits, under his control make up that kingdom and that's where our fight is and hardly anybody knows it today and if they do know it they just mouth it off the top of their head but they don't know how to get in and fight a good fight to wage a good warfare that's right this is why as I said earlier if you're going to to fight the enemy, the best thing to, to know is how he operates. His instruments of warfare, how he approaches people, how he dogs people. When you know this, then you can do something about it. In 2 Corinthians 10, God's word is tremendously illuminating and enlightening along these lines. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are carnal. No, are what? Not carnal. Not carnal. They're not carnal. But mighty through whom? God. To one purpose, to the pulling down of what? Well, whose strongholds do you think we're going to be pulling down? Satan's. Satan's, that's right. Not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but the God of this what? And it says pull them down. <laughs> that means you break them up. Break them into smithereens. Casting down, verse 5. Imaginations. The word imaginations in the critical text would read reasoning. Casting down your own sense knowledge reasonings. And every high thing, the word high thing is false. And every false thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of who? Boy, what a tremendous truth. And bringing into captivity, look at that. Bringing into captivity. You take control over every thought you've got. Bring it into captivity in obedience to whom? Amen and amen. Not in obedience to what I think or you think or someone else may think, but you bring your mind in obedience in every thought in captivity to Christ. And the only way you can know Christ is through his word. You don't get to know Christ through a commentary. You go back and read the Word. What the Word says, it means, and what it means, it says. And you work the integrity and accuracy of that Word. 
and you bring your thoughts, you make your mind track with what the Word says. Bring it in a cap, you control it. You tell your mind, now look, you old baby, you believe what that says. You walk on what that, you hold, say what that says. Bring your mind in captivity to every, everything the Word says. That's what it's talking about. That's something. Whew. Boy, look at chapter 11. <laughs> I love you. Man, chapter 11. But I fear less, verse 3, by any means, as the serpent beguiled who? Through his subtlety, his slyness. And you talk about being sly? He's so sly that he's so slippery, slippery, that there's just no slyness to describe how slippery he is. And what does he do? He, so your minds should be what? Corrupted. Corrupted. That's where it goes to operation. Satan cannot operate except he has a body. Devil spirits can't operate unless they have a physical body. And the greatest thing that controls that physical body is what? So if he can get into the mind, and if he can control the mind, he can get accomplished what he wants to, whether you're Christian or non-Christian. And usually he'll pick a Christian. Because he already owns the other one. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is where? In Christ. That's right. Because it's so simple and it's so easy. It's so basic. Satan will come and he'll, he'll say, oh, no, 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 that's too easy. Oh, you couldn't believe it. That's too big. Well, he's already corrupt in your minds. Don't let him do it. You're responsible for taking into captivity your every thought. And you've got to say what the Word says. Your mouth has to say the same word the Word says. Because the Word of God has the same power today on the lips of believers that it had the first time it was ever spoken. In chapter 2 here of 2 Corinthians, perhaps I ought to just show you this great truth. Lest Satan, verse 11, should get what? Advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his what? Devices. That's right. Now, if, he know, if we know he's going to work through the mind, if we know he's going to take us captive in segments of our mind, then the thing to do is to work so he doesn't get in there. And outside of the word of God, and the right dividing of that word and searching that scripture and working it through from Genesis to Revelation that it fits like a hand in a glove, you will never have the ability to withstand him. In Luke chapter 13, in verse 10 it says, And he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, inside of that synagogue was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity. Eighteen what? For eighteen years she had been at the place where help should have been available. She was at the seat of religion. She was at the place where they were supposed to operate. She was in the synagogue. But she still had a spirit of infirmity, which she had had for what? 18 years, and she was all bowed together, just like this. This is the way she was. All bowed together. She had been this way for 18 years. She could not straighten up. Now maybe she had a couple discs broken. 
Or maybe she just walked with stooped shoulders so long that she just got droopier and droopier and droopier as the years went by, huh? I don't know. I haven't read the word yet. But I do know that she was in the synagogue and for 18 years she had just been bowed down all tied up like this. And she could in no wise lift up herself. She could in no wise straighten up. Wherever she went, she was always bowed together, always tied like she was tied down. Like she just had a great weight tied to her whole body, just holding her down like this all the time. And she could in no wise straighten herself up. She couldn't do it. Verse 12 says, And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, What? Thou art loosed. Thou art what? Loosed. Thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately, immediately, she was made straight, and she glorified who? <laughs> this happened in the synagogue. It was the Sabbath day, a day when God's people came together to study the Word and so forth. The woman had been bound like this for 18 years. She couldn't straighten herself up. Jesus came in and laid hands on her. To find out by word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and discerning of spirits what the scar was, and whatever it was, he must have taken out, because he said, and immediately. And immediately means pronto, right away, booms, right now, she was lost. Amen. Amen. That's a good operation. Even the psychic surgery boys can't do that good. And immediately. Immediately, she was made straight, and she glorified who? Now, that's wonderful. She at least didn't run around and glorify Satan. She glorified the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the true God. And you're always glorifying one or the other in your life. You're either glorifying the true God or you're glorifying Satan by your walk. And by your believing. Either one or the other. It's never both and. It's one or the other every moment. Into my mind flips the record in the book of Acts. Remember? That there was great rejoicing in that what? Because of what had happened. But there wasn't such great rejoicing here. For verse 14 says, And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. They said, you can't do this, Jesus. It just can't be done. You know why? Because it's a Sabbath day. Really, were these so-called people interested in the deliverance of this woman? Now, she'd been there for 18 years. And I'm sure that every week... She put in her money. I'm sure she helped with the sewing circles. I'm sure she made it very a very good person to sit and work on jobs where you had to be bowed together to pick up paper from the floor or something. I'll bet she was fabulous. But got no what? Deliverance. Because... It couldn't be done on the Sabbath day because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, in them therefore come to be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. <laughs> the Lord then answered him and said, You rot. Did Jesus have love? Well, if there's anybody else had any more, 
then you should have been Jesus. And yet he called the leader of that synagogue and all of that top brass, what did he call them? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. And if you went around today and calling people that, they tell oh, you don't have any love. Yeah, because if you got Jesus, you're all love. That means you love the devil to death and let him just kill the hell out of you. Oh, oh, come on, what's the matter with you? But that's the society in which we live in. I call it smother love. That's what I call it. That's not love at all. That's right. Where can you read me in God's word where it says that any man walks over a child of God, a son of God? Where can you read me in God's word that we can let people who are devil possessed walk over the top of a Christian believer? You only hear that in theological schools and out in the unbelieving theological world in which we live. That's right. Nobody walks over this boy. Just nobody. Because I'm a son of God. And if I'm a son of God, I stand for God and standing for him. Don't you try walking over this. Because when you walk over me, you're walking over God. And that ain't good. <laughs> That's right. For God is in Christ and Christ is in... That's how you have to walk too. He called those people what? And today if you dare to walk out, you, you know, in the communities and say to the same thing to some of them, they say you haven't got any love. Well, I want to tell you, they're the ones that haven't got it. If they had it, they'd be coming your way and asking for your help to set some of their people free. Jesus said, you old hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath day, if he lose his blooming ox, or if he lost his lousy ass someplace in the, from the stall, led him away to watering. Someplace said if you got something falling down in a well, wouldn't you get it out? You know what he's saying? They're more concerned about their ox, their asses, the stuff they make money with, than they are in setting people free. Same thing today. I never went to a meeting in my life in the 17 years in my particular unbelieving denomination where we weren't taught on how to get people money out of people. I never went to one meeting in all of those years where they held the word of God par excellence. I never was taught that God set his word above all his name. In those meetings, I had to finally get down on my hand and face, so to speak, and get my nose in the Word and just read what the Word said and start walking on it. If you take that good care of your Oldsmobile and your Chevrolets and your Volkswagens, <laughs> what about God? If your old Volkswagen ran off the bridge into the creek down here at the Jordan, we'd go out there and help you get it out even on Sunday night headquarters at the way. Well, if you're going to do that for the ox and the asses, what about this woman? What about this one who was all bowed together for 18 years? What, day, what difference does the day of the week make? The important thing is that she gets delivered. See, on the Sabbath day, they take their ox and ass out and give them some water. But a woman injured, hurt, beat, it's the wrong thing to do to help them. Were they sincere? But sincerity is no guarantee for truth. Jesus said, you all hypocrites. Then in verse 16, a tremendous truth. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of whom, that means she was a believer. Being a daughter of Abraham, she was a believer. The daughter of Abraham, a believer in the believer's line. Now look at it. I didn't write the word. Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath what? Bound. Who bound this woman? Amen. Amen. Then there has to be a Satan around to do it. 
Satan had bound this woman. Lo, these how many years? Eighteen years. Be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Satan had bound her for 17 years. You could have sent her to every psychiatrist and psychiatric field. You could have taken her in an x-ray, all of the, the vertebrae and everything else. Physiologically and every other way, you'd have seen nothing wrong. And yet, you could have lectured her and said, No, I know there's nothing wrong. It's got to be in your mind. Why don't you straighten up a little bit, you know? I'll tell you what's happened. You've just thought being bowed together so long, and you just got bowed together. Why don't you change your thinking, you know? And if you just change your thinking, you could straighten up because there is absolutely no reason for your being bowed together. You could have put her under on a surgeon's table with the finest surgeons in the world. They could have taken out one vertebra or two or three or not, glued them all together with pins or something. That still wouldn't have straightened her up. Because that was not the cause. And there's a great law involved in all of life that when the cause is removed, the symptom will disappear. He said to the woman, be what? Loosed. Loosed to what? A devil spirit. Because who had bound her? Say, that's what the word says. That's what it means. And if you say anything else than that, either you're a liar or God's a liar. And God's no what. That's right. Just smoke that in your pipe. Try. Right. Bowed together. And all Jesus said, be loose. And that little old gal straightened up after 18 years. She didn't have to go to a masseur. She didn't have to go to an osteopath or a chiropractor, or any other bone rubber, all she had to do was just get loose, and I tell you, she walked down that street. Uh, it's a wonderful, isn't it? And you know all that was wrong with her? Satan had one. That's plenty. That's plenty, and that's the field very few of us know little, if anything, about today. Eighteen years in the synagogue, week after week after week after week, and no help. Sounds like our modern times. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that day is over with in your life and mine. We can help people if they want help. Like a person comes like this, they want help. We can help but if they don't want help, you can't help them. But we're not concerned about those who don't want help. We're concerned about learning how we can help those who do want help. That's where we ought to start. That's the purpose of this advanced class. Once the cause was removed, what happened to the symptom? The law. It's a law in the natural realm. It's a law in the spiritual realm. And God's a God of law and a God of order.